Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. The Miracle at the Marne by late August 1914, Germany had successfully forced passage through Belgium and was attempting to execute the next steps in the Schlieffen Plan, the envelopment and neutralization of the Allied armies on the Western Front. With the exception of the delay caused by Belgian resistance, the German army appeared unstoppable. In a series of battles, the Germans had swept all before them, forcing the French armies under the command of Field Marshal Joffrey and the British Expeditionary Force under the command of Sir John French to retreat towards Paris. As the German army continued to press forward, the French and British forces began to collapse back towards the Marne, dangerously exposing Paris to capture. And this was not the only Allied problem. According to one soldier, French and British troops were dog-tired, half asleep and dreaming at times, barely strong enough to keep moving, let alone fight. They were also desperately short of junior and non-commissioned officers. In the early days of fighting, these men had led from the front and had literally been wiped out. The Allied armies were also short of ammunition, horses, food, and weapons. If these problems weren't enough, the relationship between the French and British forces was not well defined, and the differences between senior Allied commanders threatened to derail the entire war effort. French commanders complained of a lack of support they received from the British, and the British charged that the French continually retreated without warning, exposing the flanks of the BEF to the enemy. Frustrated by what he saw as French indecision, and badly shaken by the severe losses the British forces had incurred delaying the German advance, Sir John French indicated that he was going to pull British troops off the line, leaving the French to fight the Germans alone. With all of these troubles plaguing the Allies, as August turned into September, a German victory seemed likely. Even though the German army was riding a wave of victory, it was also facing difficulties. Germany prevailed in the first four weeks of the war, but it had encountered bruising obstacles in the form of unexpected Belgian resistance and the determined defense of British and French forces. The German army was also short of supplies, communication and supply lines were stretched to a breaking point, and its men were exhausted from the month-long push into France. It had even been robbed of divisions that had been sent to the Eastern Front to counter the coming Russian threat. Despite these difficulties, however, the German general staff was not alarmed. On the 4th of September 1914, at his headquarters in Luxembourg, Kaiser Wilhelm II exalted, It is the 35th day. The 35th day of the war had a very significant meaning to the German general staff. The meticulously thought-out Schlieffen plan anticipated a victory over France within 35 to 40 days of combat. It was reasoned that after the 40th day, Russia would be mobilized. Therefore, the decisive battle to end the war would come between day 35 and 40. Winning the war against France by day 40 would allow Germany to avoid a damaging two-front war and still have plenty of time and resources to turn and crush the Tsar's forces in the east. Thus, on day 35, the Kaiser and the German general staff confidently saw the end of the war in the west in sight. What the Germans did not take into account, though, was that while their timetable and expectations remained based on the Schlieffen plan, their disposition of troops and troop strength was no longer what Schlieffen had intended. Schlieffen had envisioned a massive right wing that would brush up against the English Channel and then sweep down and envelop the Allied armies. To his last days, he had repeatedly stressed that the right wing had to remain strong. Over the years, however, the German general staff had ignored this plea, siphoning strength from the right wing to reinforce what they saw as the atrophied left wing. By late August 1914, as day 40 inched closer and closer, even more of the divisions that made up the right wing were peeled off and sent to the Eastern Front. As a result, while still formidable, the right wing made up of the German First Army and commanded by General Alexander von Kluck did not have its intended level of strength. Despite this change, Kluck still began to move southward to complete the envelopment Schlieffen envisioned. 
Meanwhile, as the Germans advanced, the French commander Joffre, the nominal Allied leader, struggled to pacify his feuding commanders and reorganize a more effective army. Joffre remained calm and unworried, even as the French government fled Paris for Bordeaux and as doomsday orders were issued to destroy the Eiffel Tower, which was being used to transmit the French general staff's radio communications. Orders were also given to blow up the bridges of the Seine if the Germans came closer to taking the city. French General Joseph Galliani, recalled from retirement, was quickly turning Paris into a fortified city and a definite obstacle for the Germans. In the midst of this chaos, Joffrey methodically disbanded the army of Alsace, which was no longer needed to protect the flank of a proposed French advance into its lost territories, and used rail lines to transport its men north of Paris. He then added enough replacements to this force to bring its strength to eight divisions, renaming it the French Sixth Army. He then formed another army, the Ninth Army, under the command of Ferdinand Foch, to fill the gap between the French Fifth and Fourth Armies. With the French armies reorganized, Joffrey turned his attention to Sir John French. When French continued to indicate that British troops would not be rejoining the main line of battle, Joffrey called in British War Secretary Herbert Kitchener. Kitchener, the famed British war hero of Khartoum and Omdurman, was startled by what he perceived as French's defeatism. Essentially, the commander of the BEF was abandoning France and putting Britain's forces in a no-win situation. They would either be rounded up after a German victory on the continent, or would have to be evacuated back to England, or they would have to sit by and shamefully watch as the French armies garnered all the glory by defeating Germany single-handedly. At the end of August 1914, in an emergency session of the British cabinet, Kitchener voiced his opinion that French's actions would lose the war for the Allies. He then met with Prime Minister Asquith and informed him of his intention to visit French and force him to move the BEF back into the line of battle. An hour later he was on his way to France, aboard the fastest steamer Winston Churchill, the first naval lord, could procure for him. He arrived in Paris on the morning of September 1st. French was unhappy about this visit and requested that the meeting take place at the British Embassy in Paris, as a way to remind Kitchener that as War Secretary he was merely the political head of the army, not French's direct superior. This attempt to undercut Kitchener failed. Although he was now a civilian, Kitchener met French dressed in his field marshal uniform, a not-so-subtle way to impress upon French that, civilian or not, he was a senior officer with the added weight of a war hero. Predictably, the two men had a heated discussion, but in the end, French agreed to move British troops back onto the line, as long as French troops supported his flanks. By this time, the German forces were within 30 miles of Paris. General Alexander von Kluck had received reports that the French Fifth Army was positioned north to south, but was moving eastward. This action exposed the French Army's vulnerable left flank. Kluck immediately ordered his forces southeast, hoping that they would be able to smash the left flank of the French Army. Unknown to Kluck, however, the Sixth Army was in perfect position to attack his flank, as he marched in front of it to attack the flank of the French Fifth Army. French aviators and radio operators reported on Kluck's movement. As he lunged for the French army, a 30-mile gap opened up between the German first and second armies. Back in Paris, French General Galliani received reports of this gap and decided it was time to strike. He believed that with speed and devastating force, the sixth army could destroy the German army. First, however, he had to convince Joffrey to halt the French retreat and then Joffrey would have to get the sixth neighbor, the BEF, back in action, and then they would all have to mount an attack. On September 3rd, Joffrey ordered a halt to what had been a general French retreat. The 6th of September was chosen as the day the Allies would begin to mount a counterattack. On the morning of September 5th, however, scouts for the German 1st Army made contact with French troops of the 6th Army advancing across its front. The German commander immediately attacked, and the advancing troops found themselves under attack from positions that had been previously unoccupied. 
As daylight waned, it seemed that the Germans had succeeded at least in temporarily halting the French advance and had bought Cluck the time he needed to wheel to face this threat. It also appeared that the initiative had been ripped from the Allies. With battle beginning a day earlier than expected, Joffrey scrambled to regain the initiative. Sir John French, still recalcitrant even after his talk with Kitchener, was slow to commit British forces to what was becoming the first battle of the Marne. Announcing that he had to have the support of the BEF at any price, Joffrey motored the 115 miles to French's headquarters to make a personal appeal to the British commander. Joffrey was usually quite calm and laconic, but upon reaching French, he unleashed a passionate torrent of protest. He argued that France was utterly committed to this battle, and that down to the last company France would fight. He also argued that if Britain sat this fight out, history would judge its absence harshly. His speech ended with a plea. The honor of England is at stake. Overcome and with tears in his eyes, French replied, we will do all we can. A staff member translated this as a yes to Joffrey, and satisfied the French commander sat down for tea. Having the British agree to fight was one thing, however. Having them in place when needed would be more difficult. It would take time for the BEF to march back to the front, and at this point, even with the promise to fight, the BEF would start the battle separated from the French 5th and 6th armies. Nevertheless, Joffrey was satisfied that everything had been done to save the Allied cause. Later that evening, at his own headquarters, he wrote a message to the troops. At the moment when the battle upon which hangs the fate of the country is about to begin, all must remember that the time for looking back is past. Every effort must be concentrated on attacking and throwing the enemy back. Troops which can no longer advance must at all cost keep the ground that has been won, and must die where they stand rather than give way. Under present conditions, no weakness can be tolerated. Meanwhile, the Germans were reorganizing their lines to face the coming attack. In doing so, they completely abandoned the aims of the Schlieffen Plan. Rather than menace Paris or be in a position to encircle an entire Allied army, the German right wing was now completely committed to dealing with the French army it had encountered on September 5th. The Schlieffen plan was meant to result in the encirclement of the Allied armies, but this new action was turning the tables, turning the encirclers into the encircled. As Cluck's forces turned to face the threat of the French 6th Army, the gap between his 1st Army and General Karl von Bülow's German 2nd Army widened to 30 miles. The French 5th Army and elements of the BEF, which had been marched quickly to the front, began pouring into this gap and attacking the German 2nd Army. Nevertheless, for a few days it seemed like the German forces would weather this attack. Between September 6th and 8th, German forces came very close to driving the Allied armies back. To help reinforce the faltering 6th Army, Gallieni commandeered 600 taxicabs in Paris to transport reinforcements to the front. These taxicabs ferried approximately 6,000 French soldiers to the front, and thereafter were affectionately known as the Taxis of the Marne by the French people. Although today their value in terms of the battle's outcome is questioned by scholars, the taxis continue to be celebrated as patriotic symbols. Soon the tide turned in favor of the Allies. On September 9th, day 40 of the German plan for victory, the German armies received the order to retreat from Chief of Staff Helmut von Moltke. Pursued by the Allies, the retreating German forces eventually halted at the River Enna digging in and preparing lines of trenches, a foreshadowing of the rest of the war. By the end of the German retreat on September 12th, it was clear that the first battle of the Marne had been a huge strategic victory for the Allies. For beleaguered Allied forces, it was a miracle, and would later be referred to as the miracle at the Marne. It had halted the German advance, spoiled the German plan to avoid a costly two-front war, saved Paris, and had done a great deal to boost the morale of the Allied troops. However, even as the German army dug into the earth of the Enna, it was also the beginning of trench warfare, and a deadly stalemate that would forever characterize the nature of the Great War.
Over two million men had fought in the first battle of the Marne, resulting in over five hundred thousand casualties. Before the war was over, a second battle of the Marne would be fought in 1918. This battle would also be decisive. Just as the first battle of the Marne ushered in trench warfare and stalemate, the second battle of the Marne would mark the beginning of the end of the war. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams@norfolk.gov.